All right, so the background is this. Um, ads, advertisements online have been changing over the last, oh, I'd say probably 10 years. And there have been more ads that are of this style of ad called native ad. That's the advertising industry's term for an ad that's designed to resemble a non-ad. Um, and they've been, become fairly common. So here's an example of a magazine. This is a, from a magazine that reviews cars. And um, this uh, magazine has articles uh, that uh, this is an article that reviews a car. So the, the staff of the magazine reviews the articles. But uh, so if you subscribe to this online magazine, you can see these car reviews. But mixed in with the car reviews are paid content. So this is an article that was written by the staff of Subaru, not by the magazine. Okay. And so the question is, can people tell if that's an ad or not? It is marked. It says, this post is pre presented by Subaru. And the Subaru logo is right here. So that's, that's the marking. OK, and then similarly, as search engines have become more and more common over the last 10, 15 years, um, uh, more heavily used, there's more and more use of what are what's called paid search results. So, so here, this is Bing, the search engine Bing, and someone has done a search for air purifier, and what ha has come back are this. If you can see very carefully, there's a there's a gray box here. Ads related to air purifier. So this is the label for those, and down here we have so. These are all, everything down to here is paid results, and that's regular results. So everything down to there is an ad. And, and then, of course, here, ads related to air purifier. There are more ads over there. So the Federal Trade Commission policy is people should be able to distinguish ads from non ads. Um, and so they wanted to do a study to know if people can reliably distinguish ads from non ads, given the prevailing methods of prevent presenting ads, um, because they wanted to be able to make policy, basically. And so they hired me and a few other people to uh, design and conduct and then um, and analyze a study uh, on that topic. Well, of course, when you're doing research, you have to check to see if anyone has already done it. There was. There's not a lot on this topic, uh, it's, and it's not only in the HCI literature, but it's also in the marketing literature. So, so you have to sort of go out of your HCI comfort zone and look, look in uh, marketing uh, research uh, journals and things like that. And fortunately, we had some people on our team who were marketing people, so they were aware of that literature. So what we found was that there were a few relevant studies overall and that there were uh, studies, there were surveys that relied on self-reports. Basically, um, they ask you, uh, uh, you know, I, here, this is, look at this. Is this an ad or not? It, look at this. Is this an ad or not? So th there, were, there were surveys that did that. And then there were s studies that examined the effect of ad labeling on click-through and purchasing, but didn't actually ask people uh, about ad recognition or didn't even didn't assess ad recognition in any way. They just they were more focused on the issue of whether people bought or whether they went through to the next page. So, um, so the our commission was to design a, an exploratory study. This was supposed to be a first in a series of studies um, uh, to determine people's ability to recognize ads. And so uh, what we did with the FTC's um, blessing and assistance was um, 
design a study where people would look at unmodified uh, web pages and be given little tasks to do and would also look at modified web pages uh, that were modified to make the ads more, the ad marking, the ad um, disclosures more salient uh, based on standard web design and user interface design principles. So, and also um, the FCC wanted us to, to sort of use eye tracking in the study to um, try to understand, first of all, for ourselves, you know, how useful is eye tracking? Can it actually be used to learn anything useful? And, um, you know, how do you do it? And, um, you know, and if, we, if it is useful, will it tell us anything about people's um, ad recognition? So um, the FTC has software that allows them to capture websites containing ads to some depth, sort of like the Internet Archive captures websites and preserves them. So they don't just capture one page, they capture a page and the pages that it links, those pages link to, and you know, they can capture it to any depth they want, but they didn't, in our case, they only captured it to uh, a depth of like one or two extra pages. So, uh, so they had, they had two desktop search sites, two desktop mobile sites, two mobile article feeds, and two desktop article feeds. So basically, there were eight sites all together. Yes. It's, it, that's an old cell phone. It's not worth much on eBay. So. <laughs> sure. Um, so, actually, before I was involved in the study, they had already captured the eight websites that they wanted uh, analyzed. And then I and another uh, researcher went th through the, all those websites, through the HTML, through the through the uh, CSS and modified each of those websites based on established user interface design guidelines. You know, things like, um, well, I'll show you some examples of some of the guidelines that we used in a minute. But one thing we did w do was, you know, it was possible to look at some of these pages and go, oh, that really isn't very well designed. Let's just change it completely. We didn't want to do that. We didn't want to change the design completely because they, these companies have a brand, they have a, uh, a look that they want to convey, and so we didn't want to change that. All we wanted to do was make the site conform a little bit more to uh, established web design principles um, and accessibility principles and things like that. So we m intentionally modified, uh, minimized our modifications in order to retain the original page design as much as possible. So the search page sets that were used were Google Desktop Search for Tablet, Google Mobile Search for Carpet Cleaner, Bing Desktop Search for Air Purifier, Bing Mobile Search for Vitamin D Supplements, Article Feeds pages with native ads were things like Gear Patrol, that's the, that's the car magazine, a Home Page and Subaru Click Through Article Page, Yahoo Desktop, Time Magazine, Mobile News Feed, and Chicago Tribune, Embassy Studio, Mobile Article Page. I'll show you some examples in a minute. Um, the sources that we used for figuring out what are the principles that we're trying to improve based upon, what, what user interface des design principles are we using to improve the design of some of these pages? And those principles came from these sources, okay? You know, an important one being, you know, uh, the Nielsen Norman um, senior, senior Citizens on the Web, usability.gov, research based web design and usability principles, my book, Designing with the Mind in Mind, and uh, web accessibility for older users from W3C. So, the kinds of user interface guidelines that we sort of compiled and then, uh, you know, Design, redesign pages in order to comply with 
were these. I w don't need to read them all to you, but they're, if you've done any web design, you've seen these guidelines before. They're common design guidelines that come from the W3C and el elsewhere. Um, you know, things like position and space labels so it's clear what contents items they cover, et cetera. Uh, and lastly, paid advertisements to look like advertisements, not site content or navigation. So I'm going to sh now sh quickly show you some examples. There, there uh, are a lot of examples, so I'll just go through them quickly. So here, this is the unmodified um, Google uh, shop. This is the Google resor search results for shopping for tablet. Okay, and so um, there's there's an there's a this is called the FTC calls that an ad disclosure. So there's an ad disclosure and there's another one. That is also an ad disclosure, but it's one that's less recognizable as an ad disclosure. So, uh, and it's th this is the this is the shopping carousel. You know, you can spin that carousel to the side. Okay. So what we did to it was we just said, okay, we'll take this thing, and we'll re replicate it everywhere there's an ad. We will. Sorry, I don't know what's happening here. Okay, somehow that jumped several pages. Uh, we, we've we've changed, changed this to black on uh, orange in order to increase the contrast in compliance with accessibility guidelines. We moved, we put one in here so that it would be clear that this was an ad. And we, so that's all we did. We didn't do anything else to that page, okay? Oh, uh, I, and you may have noticed that the border around the sh uh, shopping box is more prominent. Okay. So here's um, so if you click through from this box, you get to what's called the shopping page, and so on the shopping page, the shopping page looks like this, and everything on the shopping page is an ad. It's all paid placement. Okay. So we said, okay, that's the, that's the disclosure. So what we said was, no, uh, we'll, we're going to take that away and put ad on everything. Because, and basically we want to train people that that means ad. That's all. Okay, and so now, so here's mobile, Google mobile search for carpet cleaner. That's the, that's the, um, standard page, the, 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 the unmodified page, and that's the one we created. So all we had to do was make this little box darker, make the ad, uh, use it more consistently, and make the contrast greater. Like I said, we could have designed these pages a lot differently, but we didn't do that on purpose. Uh, yeah, so this is, this is the first page, the first result page for carpet cleaner. And then if you click through to th on this carousel, it takes you to the shopping page in which everything is paid placement, but we wanted to make sure people knew everything was paid placement. Paid placement. Okay, and then this is Bing, as I already showed you earlier. That's everything in this box is, is paid. Uh, everything over there is paid. This is the first organic, what's called an organic result in the industry. So we made the box darker. Uh, we, this label, the way it's, the visual hierarchy here is wrong. That is, this indicates that this goes with this. It doesn't indicate that it goes with the whole thing. Okay, so we said no, we have to change the visual hierarchy there so that this is clearly the label for this entire box. Um, and also we made the box darker and we made that label darker. Okay, so I'm... You see that pointer? Okay, I'll use this pointer. But now I have to remember to click this and use this pointer. Okay, so 
No, it's okay. no problem. So, um, okay, so, uh, yeah, so that's that one. And then this is, uh, if you click through, if you click through on this page, you get to their shopping page, uh, which, no, I'm sorry, this is mobile. So that's, that's, th this is desktop, and this is mobile. So in, mo in, in mobile, what just happened? Okay, in mobile, uh, so, so what we did was, again, uh, the visual hierarchy is wrong. That looks like it's related to this element. We separated it a little bit and made uh, the, the background darker, et cetera, okay? I, I, don't, I don't, it'll take a long time if I, to go through them all, but um, I, 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 I don't wanna spend all the time on that. So, um, so this is Gear Patrol uh, desktop. So uh, original versus modified. So this is the, this is original. Uh, that's an ad, this is not an ad. This is, okay, so now what we did was we moved the logo up here. We said advertisement by Subaru. We took the, this post is presented by Subaru. We decided that if we were gonna, if something was gonna be labeled an ad, we were gonna use the word ad or advertisement. Um, later, I'll mention that at the, uh, later remind me, I'll, at the end of the study, after people had been through all the tasks, we asked them, what do you think this word means? What do you think that word means? What do you think that word means? And we got some feedback on that. Um, but before we knew any of that, we, we decided that we would call an ad an ad, basically. Clicking the wrong thing here, okay. So there's Gear Patrol desktop. Um, uh, so now if you click through to the article, if you click through, I'm, I'm, I'm having trouble remembering which, th which thing points and which one. Um, <laughs> uh, so if you click through to this ad article, um, then uh, this is what it looks like normally without, uh, and it says, so it says sponsored post there. Okay, so what we did was we changed it to Advertisement. Okay, Time Magazine, uh, you know, you're reading your news articles as you scroll through on, the, on your phone, and it, you get to these things that say around the web, sponsored content. Okay, and so some of these are ads, most of them are ads actually. Um, and so what we did was we said, we called it paid content, and we put ad on everything that was an ad. Uh, and if you click through to the article, uh, then uh, you, this is what the article looks like normally, and this is what we changed it to look like. Uh, Yahoo, when you're reading through your Yahoo uh, feed, um, there are these things that pop up that, are, that have a slightly different background color and that tells you it's an ad, supposedly, and it says Instaflex sponsored there. And so we changed it to, you, we decided, we actually stole that ad symbol from Google <laughs> and put it everywhere. Okay. Um, and then, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, and if you click through to the article, uh, it says advertisement by Instaflex up here. Uh, and so what we did was we put that down there so you could see it better. Um, uh, Chicago Tribune, um, basically it says up here at the top, brand publishing, this is sponsored content. We made it, we made it bigger and we changed brand publishing, which is a jargon indus an industry, an advertising industry jargon term. We changed it to paid post. Uh, and we changed brand publishing here to paid post, et cetera. Uh, and, and then if you scroll down to the bottom of the article, it says here, uh, Lisa Schreier, brand publishing writer, and we said 
writer for Embassy Studio. So that's sort of an example. Those are examples of, of the pages that we, uh, how we change the pages. So the, the participants in the study were uh, Washington, D.C. area residents who regularly use computers. They were recruited by an agency. They regularly use computers and smartphones, a minimum of one time a week. Uh, there were all these requirements. The FTC made these requirements, not, not us. Basically, they regularly use search engines. They regularly browse websites. They had not participated in a study or focus group for the past six months. They didn't work in industries related to the study's purpose or stimuli. That is advertising, marketing, search, blah, blah, blah. Dietary drug supp supplements. They did not advertise on their own blog or website. And they, had, they met certain visual requirements, which is that they didn't have involuntary eye movement, they didn't have cross eye or wall eye, and they, wore, they didn't wear bifocals, trifocals, or progressive lenses, and they didn't wear both contact lenses and glasses at the same time because that would screw up the eye, eye tracking equipment. We used, the eye tracking equipment we used was Toby, and it was, um, it's the non-invasive kind. You know, it's, it's, it basically has a little device that sits in front of you, and it's shining, I think, lasers into your eyes, and it's sort of getting, getting where your, eye, your pupils are, are focused. Um, it's, it has to be calibrated, and it easily gets out of calibration. So it's not, it's not one of those kinds of eye tracking that a real, a real scientist would use where they would actually fix the person's head in a vise and not allow them to move it while they were doing the eye tracking experiment. These people had free freedom of head movement, which actually was kind of interesting during the study because it turns out that our older participants, can, they were asked to speak aloud as they were doing some of these tasks, and some of them couldn't talk without talk, looking at the uh, researcher who was sitting in the room. So the, the thing was constantly going out of calibration. Um, okay, so there were 48 Washington, D.C. area residents uh, passing that screener. Uh, we screened out a lot of people. <laughs> Um, uh, approximately half of them were male and female. Uh, this is the age distribution. Uh, sorry? <laughs> um, yeah, and so uh, uh, their, their education, ethnicity, um, internet usage. We classified people as frequent or occasional users of internet, um, and then, then what we did once we had these, all these classifications is we tried to put people into conditions. We didn't randomly put them in. We tried to put them in in a way that would kind of approximately balance all those demographics across the different conditions. And they were paid $125. Uh, the design of the experiment, it was basically designed by me and another guy. Uh, it was mixed within and between subject. Each participant interacted with eight page sets. The reason that we had 48 participants was that we needed 48 in, to, in order to have this fully cross design, uh, where there, each person would see four original and four modified um, uh, page sets. And each, within that, each person would see, t within the four original, they would see two desktop and two mobile. Within the modified, they'd see two desktop and two mobile. Um, and so that means that each person saw four desktop and four mobile, but no participant saw the original and modified version of the same page set. So that was the between subject uh, aspect of the design. So 24 s participants saw each page set, and every participant saw the page sets in a different order. We, we not randomized order, it was um, permutation, permutations of, of the order. So the procedure is what you'd expect. Basically, person comes in, sits down at a desk. We explain to them about eye tracking. 
They knew about it before they came, otherwise they wouldn't have gotten there. Uh, we calibrated the eye tracking. Uh, now I say we. Um, an agency was hired to actually run the study, and we who had designed it d observed. Okay, so we weren't actually moderating the study. We were just uh, observing, uh, r sometimes remotely and sometimes on, the f on site. Um, we didn't explain the purpose of the study. Uh, the pages were presented in the context of imaginary scenarios, like you searched for a carpet cleaning service and got the results. Uh, what, look around the page and describe what you see. Do what you normally would do in this situation. Uh, the participants read each scenario aloud, and then they pressed the button which showed the page that, that w was des being described. Um, I wanted to be able to show you videos, <laughs> but I can't because the FTC considers uh, th the videos as personal, personal, personal identifying information, and they cannot let that out of their grasp. Legally, they cannot, and so I can't show any videos. In fact, I don't have any videos. I was required to delete everything I had in terms of vi uh, videos. So, um, so each person put viewed the page for one or two minutes without interruption by the moderator, uh, scrolling as they desired, and eye tracking was on during that time. Eye tracking was not on during the entire time that the participant was looking at the page, just during the first sort of interrupt, uninterrupted time. You know, do what you would do uh, during the, uh, you know, if you got to this page and they would, that's when the eye tracking would be on. Then if, when the moderator started uh, asking them questions, probing questions, then the, the eye tracking was uh, basically turned off. You can think of it as being turned off. It wasn't actually turned off, but we were not paying attention to it anymore. Um, if the participant clicked paused or about to click to a new page, the moderator stopped them and asked them probing questions. Then eventually let them go to whatever page they were going to, and then the eye tracking would start again until they paused. Okay. Um, the, the, then the moderator would direct the participant's attention to an item on the page, or an ad or a decoy. We had, we had, we directed people's attention to both ads and to decoys so that they wouldn't quickly figure out that the study was about ads, necessarily. Um, when participants click through the next page, then we repeated all these steps three through five. After, after the person had gone through eight scenarios, then they gave them a post-test in interview. What did they think the purpose of the study was? That's when we told them that it was about ads. And then we start asking them questions about what, how do you usually respond to ads on a page, and um, what is your interpretation of various ad disclosure terms like advertisement, ad sponsored, page content, etc. Um, so the data collection was as I video, video and audio to record behavior, comments. Uh, the moderator was taking notes. Observers were taking notes. Uh, transcripts were made of the videos. Uh, the Toby eye tracking, uh, as I said, it was, it was gathering data, um, and that data w had to later be processed. Um, eye tracking data needs a lot of processing before you can actually analyze it. H has anyone here actually done any eye tracking research before? Okay, a few of you, yeah. So you, you know that you, you can't, the eye tracking data is this big file of, of numbers and you have to actually do something, some, a lot of processing on it before it's actually uh, useful. But it does produce things like this. So this is a heat map. So basically what it says is, you know, this person, this is actually a, so this is a heat map, which is not an individual. This is many individuals, uh, eight individuals that actually combined and it says that when people looked at this Google search results page, you know, it's showing you where, where their eyes spent most of the time. Um, and then we also had what are called gaze plots, which sh this is for an individual. So this is for a group. That's for an individual. And it shows you 
the dots are where their eye paused, the lines are where their, how their eye moved, and the numbers on the dots, which you can't see from where you're sitting, I'm sure, are the order in which the, 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 the psychotic eye movements and, and fixations occurred. And the bigger the dot, the longer the, the eye stayed at that spot. Now, this is really nice to see. It's nice to see this, but actually analyzing these things visually is almost impossible. So th that's not how you do analysis of eye tracking data. I mean, if you, if you did an eye tracking study, and by the way, you know, to remind you, this was an exploratory study, so part of it was to get some information about how, I, how people, re whether they recognize ads or not, but was also to get some experience in for us and also for the FTC in doing eye tracking, right? And so, uh, you know, one of the things I learned from this, I would have to say, is that these things are kind of cool, but you can't analyze these. You have to analyze, I mean, if you can analyze them if you, if you have gross differences between, you know, the appearance of one is grossly different from the appearance of another. But if you only have fine differences between them in terms of the heat maps or the gaze plots, then, then that's, that's hard to sort of conclusively say, oh, people uh, you know, weren't looking at ads, that things that they recognized it as, or, 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 or they were looking at them. It's hard to say that. So, so you have to analyze the, the eye tracking data in a different way, which I'll come to. Um, so in addition to doing the eye tracking, though, we, we, we had people uh, judges independently review the videos and transcript, and they coded each, inter each um, encounter as the person recognized the ad, the person did not recognize the ad, or it's unclear whether the person recognized the ad or not. And the inter encoder agreement we had was 79%. Um, so we then calculated the percent of distributions of three ad recognition outcomes recognized ad, didn't recognize ad, and uh, unclear for both original versus modified page sets. And then um, data scientists at the FTC, not me, uh, uh, tested the significance with categorical logistic regression. I, um, I don't have a, a background of experience in doing that kind of data analysis. I, uh, I did some preliminary data analysis of this stuff using uh, non-parametric um, uh, contingency and contingency tables, uh, and basically what the FTC did was uh, they this categorical logistic regression is basically the uh, higher-powered uh, parametric equivalent of contingency tables. That's essentially what it is. Yeah. Right, and so that's why there was this unclear category. Yes, so she was she was asking she how how does how do you, how do the observers or the judges uh, know that the person recognized it as, as an ad or not? And right, because they're just looking at it, and you can tell that they looked at it. Right, but what behaviorally do you see them do that says oh? they saw that that was an ad or they thought that was not an ad. Yeah, well, something that's often, re that's really clear is, oh, that's an ad, okay? Uh, some people said, that's an ad and I never look at ads. Or they said, um, uh, oh, that's an ad, but it's relevant to what I'm looking for, so let me click on it. Or th they did something that made it clear that they knew that it was an ad. Um, or they did something that made it clear that they didn't know it was an ad. Like they, they go, well, I didn't know, uh, you know, they would say something that would they indicate that they thought it was a, a, a editorial content. Um, and sometimes what would happen is when they discovered that it was an ad, they would not be happy. Okay, 
And then, so that's why there were these unclear situations because we didn't, it wasn't a forced choice. We didn't tell people, tell us if you think this is an ad or not, okay? In, in retrospect, I might have designed, we might have designed the study with some of that in it, but we didn't. We designed it so that people just sort of naturally did what they would do when they got to the page, and then we had to decide whether they thought it recognized something as an ad or not. And that was, that was, a, 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 that was I w what I would say is a problem in the study, and when we get to the end where we're talking about how, what, you know, c future research, I'll, I'll mention, you know, the possibility of doing forced choice where we say, you know, is this an ad or not? Uh, so anyway, so they tested the significance with categorical and logistic regression. And what uh, we found is that uh, uh, overall modified labels increased probability that participants recognized ads by 21%, uh, which is significant, from an average of 47% to 68%, uh, and that's similar across different page sets and different ad sites. So if you look at a graph of it, what you see is so if you look at all ads, basically this says, th th this is the percentage of people that recognized, that clearly recognized it as an ad. This is the percentage of people that did not, that clearly didn't think it was an ad. And this is the percentage of people for which it was unclear. Now these are not independent columns. If this one goes up, one of these two have to go down. I mean, because they're gonna all sum to 100%. Okay, so that's why this is like the, the parametric equivalent of doing statistics on contingency, contingency tables. You know, with contingency tables, you have, a, let's say, a two by two or a three by two table, and you wanna, you wanna know how many, what percentage of your observations fall into each of those cells, and, and the total uh, number in all the cells has to come out to 100%. And so if the number in one cell goes down, it has to go up somewhere else. Well, it's similar in this reg logistic regression. So, so basically, we have, um, so, so that's, that's all, that's recognition, that's not, not recognition, and that's unclear. But it, if they're modified, notice that this goes up. Recognition goes up, uh, not at, recognizes an ad goes down, and unclear goes down a little bit, okay? Um, so, so when you do the, and so if you sp then split it out to native ads versus um, search, so this is, so let's go back here. I'm, again, I'm having trouble remembering which, which is my pointer and which is the clicker. So this is all ads. And then this is dividing it up between native ads and search. So in native ads, um, original, those are the, that's the distribution of percentages of people. And then with modified, that's the percentage over there. So you can see that more people recognized uh, ads when uh, they were better marked. And then with search, search the, dif this, the, dis the difference was not as strong with search as it was uh, with native, native ads that are in, in news feeds. So in other words, the improvement that we made helped the people who people recognize ads in the search results case less well than in the uh, native ads case. And so when you plot those uh, regression, basically what this says is There's a 20% there's a improvement in uh, people recognizing things as ads, uh, and these are the error bars. The fact that the error bars do not overlap, see these are the 95% percent, uh, percent, uh, confidence level error bars. So if, if this was a non-significant difference, these error bars, would, these dots would be close enough to each other for the error bars to overlap each other. But the fact that the error bars for 95% confidence interval don't overlap tells you that this is a significant difference, significant effect. So this is all ads 
this is search ads, and this is native ads. Okay? Uh, okay, so now I'll talk a little bit about the eye tracking. Um, so when you do eye tracking research, in addition to getting those gaze plots and heat maps, you also um, you, you have to predefine sections of the page, the screen, and you, ha you call those areas of interest, AOI, okay? So we have to predefine those before we can even do the study. So what happens is we define the AOIs, you know, basically we define them as, uh, you know, areas around the, the ad uh, labels. Um, and then what you're going to be looking at is the, the system, the Toby system, will compile statistics on a lot of different kinds of statistics on uh, how much time did the, did the person's eye spend in this AOI, how, much t how many fixations w per mi second were in that AOI, how, how long before, uh, how long after you s first showed them the page did it take for the first fixation to occur to land in that AOI? There's a whole bunch of different statistics that can be compiled. So, um, so but basically, you have to define the AOIs, uh, areas of interest, before you can actually even collect the, the data. And so then the hypothesis it, that we had was that people look less at items they believe are ads. And but an unknown is, do better ad labels call users to look more or less? Because one could argue either way. One could argue that um, if, if people know something's an ad, are they going to avert their eyes and look more at what they think is editorial content? Or if we mark an ad better, is that going to you know, like make it the contrast higher or put it in a more prominent location? Are people going to actually look at that more. So that's, that was unknown. So, you know, so this is, this is an example of comparing consolidated heat maps. This is comparing consolidated heat maps for the participants' first look at Google desktop search results page, original versus modified. And you can see there are some differences, but Again, just by looking at this, it's hard to say what that difference is or why, why is there is that difference. The, uh, the, the, the extra, the extra dot, uh, spots of concentration here don't seem to be around the uh, ad labels or anything like them. So, uh, so uh, here, here's, here it is for mobile, so asking people to search for carpet cleaner and then um, looking at what, what they, how they look at the results. That's original versus modified. But again, you can't really analyze this. At least I don't know how <laughs> to analyze this. So what you, what you actually analyze, okay, and this is uh, um, the, yeah, so that's, that's another example of a heat map. Uh, and then these are gaze plots. Gaze plots for uh, people looking at uh, Google cl shopping click-through page initial look. Checking the gaze plots, we can see that the piece, you c there are certain questions you can, an you can answer. So for example, did anyone, you know, well, here, here take a look at this. So we have a heat map, and the heat map shows that people didn't look at this very much. That is, it, this is only lightly covered. There's, and so we, we could say, okay, well, why is that? So we can then look more carefully at the, at the gaze plots, and we can find out that of the, uh, of the uh, what was it, 12 people who saw this page, or 20, 24, the 24 people who saw this page, six never looked, 
these six, these six people never looked at that uh, ad disclosure. Okay, so I just picked out the six that didn't look at, at that. Um, and the others, their eyes did go over here at, at some point, but these six didn't, and that sort of can help explain why this is kind of so such a light smudge. So you can do some uh, sort of visual analysis with uh, the, the, the gaze plots and the heat maps. Um, but so if you look, if you, but, but if you, and if you just look at this without looking at the gaze plots, you can't tell from this whether a lot of people looked only a tiny bit or a few people looked. And the way you can answer that question is by looking at the gaze plots. Okay, um, but again, it's, even with that, it's still hard to draw any reliable conclusions, especially since the FP, FTC wants to make policy based on the results of the, this study and other studies like it. So to do the, to do the real kind of uh, analysis of eye tracking that they wanted, we had to define areas of interest, then we had to compile stats on the AOIs, which, which included things like, the, you know, the TOBI system and most eye tracking systems are set up to do this. Number of participants who fixated on the AOI. Average number of fixations on the AOI per, per, per participant. Average time to first fixation on AOI. Average time spent in AI. There are actually dozens of these metrics that you can, you can have the software compile for you. But as we learned in doing this study, even that can be problematic because, well, we arbitrarily designed these AOIs, right? We drew the lines around each ad disclosure. Should we draw it big? Should we draw it small? Should we gerrymander it? Should we make it circular? Should we make it square? You know, we don't know. You, and we've gotten different numbers if we did it differently, okay? So, and, it, and well, one of the things we learned is if you make your AOI too small, the Toby will never think that you look there, anyone looked there because it's tiny, right? The chances that an eye will land exactly inside that AOI are small. If it's too big, you'll get lots of spurious fixations, right? Should AOIs be round, oval, or rectangular? Can they be every irregular shape? Can you have AOIs within AOIs? Right? Can, can you say, okay, this ad area over here on the right side of the page is an AOI, and inside that we have some AOIs. Does that make sense? Uh, and then finally, as, as you all know, um, fix it, the fact that somebody fixes, fixates on something for a tenth of a second doesn't mean that they saw it. Um, we also discovered all these other problems with eye tracking, which is that the eye tracker often loses calibration. It registers too high or too low, too far left or too far right. Some people wore glasses. We, remember we said you, you can't be in the study if you're wearing contacts and reading glasses because that really screwed up the eye tracking equipment. But if they just wore reading glasses or they just wore contacts, we let them. And sometimes it turned out that there were some pairs of glasses that just didn't work with the eye tracking. And then participants would lean back and they, while they were working and they'd lean forward and some of them would sort of go down to the page like that. And like I said, many of our older participants would say, well, I'm, I'm now I'm trying to find this and now I'm trying to find that, like that. And we try to dissuade them of, of that, but it was, you know, difficult. So, uh, so as I said, the hypothesis was people look less at ads with improved labels. We use regression testing to test the effect of labeling on gaze time, uh, measures percentage change in gaze time between unmodified and modified ads. Okay, so this is, the, this is about eye tracking. So, so remember, I, we were analyzing this data many different ways. Uh, so there was first the data on, not on eye tracking, but on the, the uh, um, uh, the, the judges' classification of did they recognize, did they not recognize, or was it unclear? And there we found a significant effect. 
Now the question is, is there a significant effect in the eye tracking? Um, again, I, I, I'm going to tell you about these results because they're in the FTC report. I did not analyze this data. Okay? The data scientists at the FTC analyzed this data. Basically, what they said was better labeling, reduced time, participants looked at ads significantly for search results and not, not quite significantly for native ads, which is actually opposite of what we, in other words, what we found in the, uh, with, the, with the classification, the judge's classification of whether people recognize something as an ad or not, uh, what we found there was that the effect was of modifying uh, the websites was stronger for native ads than it was for um, uh, search, uh, search results. But here, uh, reduced time, better labeling, reduced time people looked at ads significantly with search results, but not, not sig quite significantly for native ads. And it, again, it, it did, they, there was no correlation because that they were opposite. So, so here is overall search. Um, this is uh, recognized with, without ag ad recognition controls, with ad recognition controls. And here the question is, do, do the... Um, so these do not look significant, the differences between the blue and the red in any case. Correct. But they're not supposed to be. What the, 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 here, the question is, are they significantly different from zero? And here, the, the error bars are, do not overlap zero. And here they do. OK, so, 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 um, so what this says is, uh, without ad recognition controls, with ad recognition controls, um, so this is, so, so the, 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 this graph is showing something slightly different. The other one was showing uh, the, the difference between uh, the percentage of people who recognized versus uh, who, were who, were who were classified as having recognized something as an ad versus the ones who were classified as not recognizing versus um, unclear. This is, uh, uh, oh yeah, okay, I, I, yeah, I remember what this is now. <laughs> it took me a second. Um, what, basically, think of this as the, the red results and the blue results are really more or less the same thing. What happened was um, the, people, the people who did the analysis, they did the analysis without paying any attention to, without factoring in the fact that uh, whether people had recognized ads or not based on the other analysis, okay? So they did one analysis, one, one regression of the eye tracking results without uh, factoring in what happened in the previous analysis. And then they did another analysis trying to uh, uh, factor in what happened in the other analysis. Okay, and so the question is, is, is our ability to predict going to be better when we factor in the results of our other, uh, our other analysis? And the answer is no. In all cases, uh, factoring without ad recognition controls, with ad recognition controls. In other words, this doesn't, the red ones don't factor in um, uh, our, the results of the other uh, analysis and the blue ones do, and it doesn't really make any difference. But what does make a difference is that um, with uh, that that people did look less at the the disclosures at the ads. Um, uh, that this shows that people did look less at the ads uh, in overall and in the search, but not in native. Yeah, not in native ads. So the conclusions of the study were people cannot always recognize whether an ad content is a paid ad or not. Improved ad labeling based on accepted wage, uh, web design standards can improve 
people's ability to recognize ads and page search results. Uh, th there's a suggested finding that better ad labeling causes people to look, spend less time looking at ads, which of course is not what companies want. Um, eye tracking is a potentially useful research tool, but has many problems. There is a Kai paper uh, in the proceedings from 2018, and there is a full FTC report, which is online. Um, now, what do they want to do now? Well, uh, they want to try to isolate some of these factors. You know, when we, when we created uh, the ad labels, we used that criterion of minimum m modification, right? Change the website as little as you can, but still try to promote good web design practices. And what, uh, b but we didn't control for anything like position, color, in, uh, contrast, or anything like that. That wasn't controlled for. So one, one, uh, one suggestion is to repeat the study with multiple separate mods for each page so you can find out what, what made the improvement. Another idea is asking participants to make a forced choice assessment. That's your question, Perry. Um, so of whether items or ads are not reducing the chance of unclear assessments so that we would never, never have to label uh, an interaction as it's unclear whether they recognized an ad or not. Um, we talked about repeating the study with search tasks that are not shopping. Because one, one of the problems is, one of the uh, pro potential problems with the study is, um, this is a shopping task. Most of the tasks were shopping tasks. Maybe it's not important to recognize ads, to recognize the difference between ads and not ads in a shopping task as it is if you were looking for news, right? So maybe we should do this with not shopping tasks. Um, and then, you know, obvious things like studying the effect of the demographic variables on ad recognition and eye movements. Uh, that would require, <laughs> require a lot of very careful design and a, and a very high-powered statistical testing, I think. Uh, conduct a survey with a lot of participants uh, asking some of the, so yeah, so, so it's been proposed to just do some surveys, some online surveys and ask many of the same questions we asked at the end of the study. Uh, when I submitted this paper at, to Kai in, uh, in er, late 2017, early 2018, um, the re reviewer feedback was, well, this is all four years old. I mean, why are you even presenting this at Kai? I mean, four years old in the internet is like a, di you know, a century. So, and I was like, well, I, if we did the study now, I wouldn't be able to report it for four years. So uh, I, I have, can only report it when the FTC makes it legal to re report it. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, one could argue that, you know, the, th those web pages that we looked at don't look like that anymore. So let's do it again, you know, maybe. Um, Uh, these are the references, which are on the paper, and I will take any questions you have. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm Ted Selker, for anybody that cares. Um, I um, maybe am more interested not in amount of time spent on an ad as whether, you know, because I, I can't tell whether they wanted to be looking at ads or not. But I, am I, but I am curious about whether they thought they were looking at an ad or, or, or at information. Um, did you have any way of, of distinguishing whether they thought what they were looking at was information or, or uh, pr promotion? Well, um, let's see. So the assessment of whether they were, the assessment of, the judge's assessment of whether they were looking at an ad versus thought they were looking at editorial content, that, that was part of what you're asking. Uh, so in other words, we had judges make that assessment. But the other thing was that at the end of the study, 
uh, when they, we were asking them questions and it was revealed that the study was about ads, some of them then wanted to go back and look at some of the sites that they had thought were not ads and only to discover that they were ads. And let me just say, none of those people were happy. They were like, okay, I've been tricked. This is not good. I don't like this. I don't like being tricked. So, um, but um, yeah, so, so we did get feedback from people when they found that something they thought was editorial content was in fact an ad. Uh, does that, I don't know if that answers your question. I guess the main thing I was interested in is if, if there's a graph or, or a <laughs> statistic about whether they were better at recognizing whether it was editorial content or uh, information or, or ad when it, when it was identified the way you guys have tried to make it more identified. Well, you know, what, 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 our, what our graphs do show is that if, if, if it, using the modified disclosures, as the FTC calls them, people were more likely to be classified as having recognized it as an ad. Okay. Terry Roberts, Tableau Software. Um, I kind of disagree with the words you sort of put in my mouth about um, okay. my pr previous question. Um, I don't think you should be asking them, do you think this is an ad or not? Because as soon as you ask, they'll say, oh, yeah, <laughs> okay, now I see it. Uh, right. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I think you did it just right. Um, I, I would not ask, do you think this is an ad? Oh, okay. Because that, that's so different from what they're doing in real life. In real life, nobody said, nobody suggests, oh, is that an ad? <laughs> um, and th they notice it. They just do whatever they do and click or don't click. Right. Well, and that's, that's in fact the, 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 the um, logic that you're using right now is what happened at the beginning of when we were planning this study. Do we, do we put them in a forced choice situation or not? And so we said, well, no, because that's not what they do when they were looking on the web. But it leads to this problem of then you having to have judges view videos and decide whether the person saw that it was an ad or not. Uh, and then, then you get the unclears, which, which is a problem. But we, I would love to figure out another way of, of assessing. But as I said, some of the previous research, have, they, what they measured was did they buy? Did they click through? Did they, you know, uh, but you can click through to an article just as easily as you can click through to an ad. So click through doesn't really tell you what you need to know in this context. Uh, another question? Um, my name is Daniel. Um, cool study. I kind of enjoyed um, your presentation. I'm kind of curious as to what happened as to the uh, like the original intention of the study, right? To 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 affect policy. So obviously, you found something that modifications could increase people's recognition of the ad. So is this going to become policy? What or what? Okay, so, um, so let's go back to the um, the references here. Um, very shortly after the study was completed and the data analysis was in, the FTC issued enforcement policy statement on deceptively formatted advertisements. Okay, in April of two thousand. Well, no. Sorry, it was, this was actually in 2016. Uh, uh, yeah, April 18th, 2016, they issued that. Uh, and it's posted on their website. It's been there ever since, okay? Uh, so basically what that says is these are, uh, this is our policy. Um, and then they also, uh, published, um, yeah, so this is basically their policy. And they published that in order to uh, clear a legal path for them to, what the FTC does is when they see what are called unfair trade practices in any realm, okay, 
they can then go to companies and issue them letters to change what they're doing. And they wanted to be able to, uh, in conducting the study, they wanted to be able to tell them how to change what they're doing, not just you need to change it, right? Um, and so uh, they were, you know, th the whole point of this was to make policy. And, uh, and also, the reason that the whole study was kept under wraps for so long was that the assumption was that if uh, the, it's all discoverable, everything is discoverable, right? So, so if, if they enter into a lawsuit with a firm, then that firm is going to subpoena everything, right? And so they wanted to make sure that the that they had their ducks in a row before they made the fact that the, the study public, right? Right, but now they have a vehicle. They, now they have a uh, enforcement's a complicated. Yeah, they can, they can they can they, they, they can issue now. letters, right? If, especially in blatant cases, right? And also, I have to say, there was a change of administration during this whole process, right? At toward the end of it, and so uh, uh, the FTC is less likely to go after private companies now than it was. Two year, three years ago. Question, your name first. Hi, my name is Alf. Uh, I have three questions, so shall I Go. ask you all of them or one after another? Sorry? I have three questions. Question number one. Question number one. Question number one. Um, ad placement happens all over everywhere, right? So is, was this study specifically for the web domain? Yes. Um, and how, how do they approach to, to based on what you experience with them, like ad placement in movies and TV series? And I mean, they don't have any type of disclosure, right? You know, and then yet you see drinks and all kinds of other stuff. Uh, so that's the first question. And, and yeah, so let me answer that one first. Right. Because uh, my short term memory is not what it used to be. Um, <laughs> uh, they, this study was focused on web, and um, in fact, see what, what happened was that the FTC realized th they've always, you know, for 50 years, for, they've been interested in, you know, deceptive advertising practices and, and enforcing rules about them. But native ads in web feeds and, and, uh, and uh, paid search results are kind of new. So uh, they were getting behind the eight ball on that, right? So they decided they had to do something about that. So actually the first thing that they did was they called a conference. They called a conference and um, let's see, where is it? Uh, it's not here. Anyway, actually in 2013, they held a conference at the FTC in which they invited me and they invited a bunch of other people uh, uh, and companies who were involved in uh, online advertising and said, we need to talk about online advertising and how it's presented to people. And so then they had this conference. Uh, I gave a presentation on perception, human perception, and uh, other people gave presentations on, on you know, common ad advertising techniques uh, and uh, you know, what's acceptable and what is not acceptable. And, but the FTC at that point did not make any policy. Right, they were just starting the process, sort of throwing out a, a thing saying, we're going to start looking at this. Um, and then from there, uh, they, they went on to develop this, start the study in 2014 so that they could actually make, start making policy. But they didn't want to make policy based on somebody's um, you know, feelings. They wanted to make policy based on some data. And that's where they did the study. Uh I, so I still get a newspaper, and in the newspaper, 
if an advertisement looks like editorial, it has to have a big thing at the top that says advertisement. So the FTC is working in other domains as well. But we don't see those in movies and other bunch of other, you know, right. uh, platforms and medium. Okay. No, I understand it, but you know, where where is the line? You had two. You had three questions. Right. Question number two: uh, Did you look at the uh, gay plot animations uh, to see before and after what people do, where they look at before they notice the ad? Can, can say say again. I, I didn't catch everything you said. Sure. Did do, did you look at the gaze plot animations to see what happens before and after they notice the ad um, no. disclosure? No, we didn't look at that. Um, I, frankly, I, I'm sort of too new to, to eye tracking to really go into deep detail about it. Uh, I left most of the eye tracking analysis to the data scientists at the FTC. I just um, want to put in a plug for eye tracking. Eye tracking has been a very effective tool used by many, many people throughout many, many different kinds of experiments. Yes. In spite of your frustrations. Right. Uh, no. A lot of people have gotten very good. Data yeah. And, and, and there are different eat. kinds of eye tracking too. You know, there's there's more invasive kinds where you basically train people not to move their head. Or or, or inhibit their head movement. Sorry. Or inhibit their amount of head. Movement. Yeah. Or, or or inhibit the amount of head movement. In my case, we didn't I, do I that. put people's head on a pillow in a bed, and that was a good way of inhibiting. Yeah, we, we didn't feel, for some reason, we didn't feel we could lock participants' head in a vice while they were doing the study. <laughs> anyway, I'm just saying that, that, head, that eye tracking is not as equivocal as, 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 you, as it might seem in this talk. You had a third question. Yes, I do. Um, did you put the subjects into uh, any type of frenzy mode and see what the results might have been? Did I put the subjects into some kind of a frenzy mode to no. see what the results might have been? Frenzy mode? Yeah, so like you have two minutes and go and find this thing. No, As we opposed did not. to browsing mode, if you have 10 minutes, you can just browse in your leisure. No. Okay, I think they could have been a totally different results, um, um, different set of data. Right, right, and th right. Uh, that obviously would affect people's perception and also the amount of time that they spent with their eyes as their eyes moved around. Yes. You said <coughs> My name is Scott Scharrer. I work at SAP. Uh, I just had an observation. The one thing that's different to you from this versus print ads in the past is the content provider's revenue is directly related to if people click onto it or not to see the ad in there. I'm having trouble understanding you because there's a lot of echo here. Okay. So let me come over to where sure. you are. So go so ahead. One thing that's changed is with uh, ads coming out on different like sites, in, like CNN or if you're on SF Gateway, it might be, is now the revenue they have that they get is not only from the placement, but the click through on it. Yeah. So they have a direct incentive to, have to be more deceptive than a print ad. They get the same amount of money more they effective. get. What's that? More effective. Yeah, more effective. So they'll get more revenue. So. Yes. Right. And so, you know, it, it, it is recognized, and it was discussed actually at that conference that I mentioned, that um, the, the goals of the FTC to have people more easily recognize ads from non-ads and the goals of the advertisers are not the same. That's recognized, but the goals of the FTC and other businesses are not always the same, and the FTC still makes policy and enforces it. So. And one last question, I think, and then we'll, um, as, as soon as Terry's done, I think we'll adjourn to asking you about all sorts of other things, probably in private up there, and okay. looking, you know, get your books signed and, and everything good, and, and hopefully everyone gets to know each other better uh, as we um, wind down the evening. It related to the last question. Did you study at all the click-through of things that either they thought were ads versus the things they didn't think were ads or um, the ones that actually were ads versus not? Um, yes and no. We, we, didn't st we didn't do analysis, statistical analysis on click-through because, first of all, these pages were not captured in much depth. So 
we were, for example, with the Google search results page, we captured, they captured, I should say, the FTC captured the, the res search results page for a certain search and one layer down from that, right? Uh, and, but, but even not even all of the possible click-throughs, right? Just certain ones that were deemed to be important, like the shopping, the clicking on the shopping carousel and going through to that page. And, and so the way the protocol went, uh, you know, people, the eye tracking was turned on, people went to the page, started looking, and then when they were sort of getting ready to go to another page, the moderator stopped them and asked them some questions, probing questions, and then let them go again, and then they would click through. So, so they only clicked through, or were allowed to click through, first of all, they could only click through to certain pages, very limited set, and they, they only, uh, when they clicked through, it wasn't like we were letting them freely explore at that point. They, they had already been stopped, asked questions, and now allowed to go again. And at that point, they clicked through to something they had already said that they wanted to click through to. Um, so there wasn't uh, a click through or not click through kind of assessment, if, if, that, if that's what you're asking. Yes. Yes, you're right. Um, I, we didn't do that. Well, actually, it's it, it's there in the data, right? It's in the it's in the it's in the uh, uh, the transcripts and the videos. Uh, just that we haven't analyzed that. You know, one of the things about this is that when the study was done, the FTC wanted to send me the data so I could start analyzing it. And there was no way they could send it. First of all, they couldn't send it over the internet because that's kind of, it's private, inf very private information. So uh, they just shipped me a hard disk and it was a half a terabyte <laughs> of data sure. uh, that I had to sort of start digging into. Um, but so there's, there, there's, there are dissertations upon dissertations in, on a hard disk at the FTC that, you, that could be done. So vi visual uh, coding, coding video, of course, is, is, a, is an art. And usually when you do it, you have uh, more than one person corroborate um, yeah. the, the, such a thing. Um, so this is, a, uh, um, of course, a very interesting study. And uh, we're all very interested in, in this policy. I think uh, it's great that you um, uh, did this work. And uh, we look forward to more such work and maybe you know, other people here would be like to be helpful if, if you if you need sure. them. Um, and at this point, it's nine o'clock, and I just want to uh, thank everybody for having come this evening. And feel free to come to talk to Jeff or get your uh, book si his book signed or whatever you'd like. So thank you very much, and we'll see you next month. Thank you.